So, as you might have got the, the hang from Mandy's talk earlier, um, we're thinking particularly today about how we use our resources, the resources that God has given us, but in particular, how we use our financial resources and the money that God has given to us. And it's the last in the series of talks that we've been doing, uh, looking at generosity issues um, and thinking about what it means to be Christians who follow a generous God and what impact that has on us as generous people. Um, and this is all part of the lead-up to our Harvest Thanksgiving celebration next week and to our annual gift day. So we've thought about how generous God is and all that he's given to us, and we've thought about how we might respond to that. But this morning we want to think about how we use the resources that we've got and especially how we use our money. And that's why you've got me talking to you this morning. Um, I'm here with my hat on as Secretary of the Parochial Church Council. I'm largely here with that hat on because Mike Moss, who is our treasurer, is in France because he has really good timing. Um, so if any of the sums don't add up, see Mike when he gets back from holiday. Um, but it's my job just to try and explain it to you and to tell you a little bit about it. So we want to try and do two things this morning. We want to talk to you about how the church uses its money. That's important because most of that money comes from you. And so we need to stand up for that and tell you what we've been doing with it as a parochial church council and a leadership and how we use our resources and approach that. But we also want to challenge each one of us as individuals as we come into this week before gift day to think about and pray and review how we use the individual resources that God has given us. So in terms of how we use our resources here at St. Peter's, we try and use them to do one thing. We do have a mission statement, and you see it every week, and I bet you never read it. If you look at your notice sheet, you'll see that down the left-hand side of the front cover of the notice sheet, there's a little column of text, and this is what it says. But because it's there every week, we tend not to notice it, and we don't see it. But this is what we use our resources here to try and do. The vision of St. Peter's Church is to see the town of Shipley changed by the power of God. We want to see this happen through a church which is filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, committed to the word of God, which serves others in order to bring God's kingdom. We want St. Peter's to become a key transforming community, bringing about this change as a church alive with the joy of knowing and worshipping Jesus Christ. Hopefully there's nothing in there that anybody could object to. You'll have heard us also say before when we've talked about this that as a, as a parochial church council, we agreed on six things, six signs that we would know that that was happening. How do we know that's happening? If these six things are alive and well in the church. So they are worship, service, mission, discipleship, fellowship, and generosity. I have to look them up every single time. I always forget one. Um, but those are the six signs that we want to see in the body of Christ that is showing that we are alive and using our resources to make that mission statement happen. So the resources that we have to be generous with, there's money, obviously, and I'm going to come on to that and what we do with it in a minute. But there are other resources as well. There's time. And I started trying to sit down this week and work out how many hours of free time this church gets to keep it on the road every week, and it's completely impossible. But if you just think about the amount of time that has been given just to make it possible for you to be sitting here this morning, and I'm not talking about anything that anybody who is paid did, that comes on top of this, but in terms of volunteer time, somebody gave up their time to arrange the flowers, somebody came in during the week to set the heating so that it would come on early enough to be warm when we got here, the wardens came very early this morning, didn't they, Karen, to unlock the church and turn all the lights on and make sure it was all ready for us when we got here. There were sides people who were there ready to welcome you when you arrived. Somebody photocopied the notice sheet and folded it up so that it was there for you to read after you'd arrived. Somebody will be staffing the welcome desk to help you learn more about the running of the church. Somebody, me actually, took time to choose the music. Other people took time, Jeff, to get it out and prepare it and be ready to lead the worship this morning. Somebody had to look at the, the prayers and the Bible readings and decided what to do with those, although clearly we left it a bit late with the Bible reading because Julie had to do it. <laughs> Somebody has spent a lot of time preparing sessions to do with the children who are out in the halls at the moment. None of that stuff cost a penny. That didn't come out of any of our financial resources, but without it, we can't operate. So the time we have and how we use that time for God is a hugely important resource for us. Prayer is another really important resource, and it's one that, as a leadership, we are increasingly feeling that God is saying, you're not doing enough of it, guys. 
It's really, really important. We're a great church at coming alongside people when they're in need and they've got a real prayer need. You know you can go to anybody. I did it this week. I wasn't feeling very well and I emailed the staff team and said, I've got a horrible cold and I'm trying to write this talk and it's just not going well. Will you pray for me? And you know immediately that they'll all go, yeah, and they did and I'm fine. And that kind of prayer is fantastic. But we think we need to be doing more corporate prayer where we come together as the body of Christ And we pray for the community outside these walls. We pray for the world beyond that. And we pray for the life of this church. And we cover everything that we do in prayer. So that's something else for us to think about. Another hugely important resource that we can't operate without. But how are we using it? And money is the one that we're often not that comfortable talking about as church leaders. Because we don't want to seem as though we're always nagging and asking for more. But without money... We can't keep the show on the road. We can't make this place work. So we just wanted to give you a little bit of information this morning about where the money this church has comes from and what we do with it. So don't worry that you can't read the words along the bottom. I'll explain it to you. Um, But this is the budgeted income for the year for 2015. So in the church, the financial year runs January to December. It's not like everywhere else. So the year that we're looking at is 2015. And Mike sat down at the end of last year, looked at what we'd had coming in last year and the year before, and worked out what he could expect us to have coming in this year. The biggest chunk of that money, so if you look at the blue column that shoots right the way up at this end, the biggest chunk of the money that we have coming in is the money that we all give. It's the money that comes from you, from me, from everybody who gives every week. So that first blue column there, That's about £153,000 worth. That's what we knew from previous years we would have coming in, either through the collection plate or through people who give by standing order and other ways and means of regularly giving to the church. There's another chunk that is also related to congregational giving. It's it's the next one down. It's another fairly big chunk. It's about £36,000 worth, and that's fantastic because that's free money. That's gift aid money. So if you give to the church and you are a taxpayer, the government will very kindly give us your tax back as long as we know about it and we can ask them for it. And so we estimated that we will get about another £36,000 off the back of your giving that doesn't cost you anything. So that's even better. That's fantastic. And the third column is also congregational giving. That's money that we have from reserve funds. So it's money that's been given for a specific purpose. Usually it's to pay the youth worker's salary or the local outreach coordinator's salary, but there are people who give regularly to those extra special funds, which gives us about another £17,000 on top. So if you add all of those together, it comes to about 84% of our income, it's over £200,000, and that's fantastic. You know, we are a generous church, there are no two ways about that, and we are hugely, hugely grateful for everything that everybody gives. We do have a small amount... And it's it's significant, but it's a relatively small amount. The other 16% comes from other sources. Um, So, again, if you start three in from the right-hand side, we get about £25,000 every year from hiring out our amenities. Um, So that's largely these buildings. We're very blessed to have them. Um, But we do hire them out, and that brings in some funds, quite a lot, 25000 Um, We get about £11,000 in grants. That's the next one around. So people like the diocese or special trusts who've got grant money to give do give us some money, for particularly for things like particular building projects and other things that need to be done in the church. And the last one is actually bigger than I would have thought. We get about £6,000 a year in fees, and that's fees that people pay for things like weddings and funerals and that kind of thing. So altogether, drum roll, that comes to about £248,000 that we could expect to receive over this year, nearly a quarter of a million, which is absolutely phenomenal for us as a church. That's what we've got to spend. So then we have to do another plan when we're budgeting, and that's what are we going to spend it on. So, ta-da, the next one. There you go. And that shows you what we spend it on. The biggest chunk of what we spend it on, 49%, nearly half, is something called the parish share, and I'll explain what that is in a minute, but that's £137,000 out of what we've got, so it's a very big chunk. The next biggest chunk is about 20%, it's about 52000 that goes on general day-to-day running. We spend about 15%, just over £40,000 on local mission activities here within the parish. Another 11%, about just over thirty grand on children and youth work. And another amount, 6%, goes to overseas missionary work um, to the people who we support who are working abroad. So that means that this year we budgeted for spending somewhere in the region of £278,000. 
Now, the sharp-eyed might have noticed a connection between that slide and the last one, and I'll come back to that later. But we wanted to talk a little bit about what each of the sections of that circle actually look like, if you can leave that up for me for now, Danny. So the big chunk, as I've said, is the parish chair, and the parish chair is a controversial one, and people do have different thoughts about it. And some people feel very strongly about the fact that we should be paying it, and other people think that maybe we should think twice about it, and there are all sorts of different views about it. But we, what we wanted to do was to be clear about what the parish share is. People often think that churches like this are funded by the Church of England and that they give us money. It's actually the, the other way around. Um, so the parish share is each diocese in the Church of England goes to each parish every year and asks them for an amount of money. They work that out by a very fair calculation. They ask us all, and you might have remembered filling forms in every three years, they ask us all what our income is. It's anonymous, of course, but they ask us roughly what our income is. And then from the number of people in the church and how much we all say we have coming in, they put that through a formula and they work out how much each parish should be able to contribute to the parish share. It's not perfect. It's far from perfect. And as I've said, it's a controversial issue. The reason it's done, though, is because that enables the Church of England to be able to provide ministry that covers every single square inch and every person living in this country. So that £137,000 goes to cover some central diocesan expenses, but for the most part, what it covers is paying for clergy. It doesn't pay for Julie because training curates come out of another budget. And it doesn't pay for Moina because nobody does, bless her, because she's a self-supporting minister, so she pays for herself. But it does pay for vicar. The vicar does not earn £137,000. Let me be absolutely clear about that. He earns a lot less than that. Uh, and clergy in the Church of England, um, as well as their stipend, their wage, if you like, they do get their housing and they get various expenses covered. But even so, for us, our one clergy person uh, that comes out of this pot doesn't come to 137,000. The reason the diocese ask us for that is all the parishes elsewhere who couldn't possibly afford to pay for their own vicar unless we helped. And tonight, Tim Lewis, who's the vicar of Girlington, is going to be coming and talking to us about what that means for them in terms of being able to provide ministry in a heavily, heavily Muslim area with a very, very small congregation. Uh, they couldn't do it unless other churches like us, who are better off, were helping to pay for that. It's a biblical principle. It's all the way through Paul's epistles. He's constantly saying the churches who have more need to be supporting the churches who have less. That's what the parish share is about. The Church of England does it so that it can provide a parish that covers every corner and every person who lives in this country. Um, and that's how they do it. As I say, it's a difficult one. It's not an invoice. If we don't pay it, then we don't get taken to court. But they come to us every year and say, this is the amount we've calculated that you should be giving us. At St. Peter's, we made a decision many years ago as a leadership that we would fund first our expenses as a church. So every month, Mike pays all the bills that are needed for the church, and then he gives what's left to the diocese. When we first made the decision to do that, it was fine because there was always enough left over. For the last 10 years, that hasn't been the case. So I think we've only once in the last 10 years, Angus, is that right? Yeah, roughly. Only once have we paid our diocesan share in full because there isn't enough left over after we've covered all our parish expenses first to meet the full diocesan share. And that is a struggle for the PCC and it's something that we really struggle with uh, as a leadership constantly. Um, but at the moment, that's the, the policy that's in place and how we do it. The next biggest chunk, then, is the day-to-day -day running of the church. That's quite a lot of money, 52000 and that's things like the office, the cleaner and caretaker, and a big, big chunk is the upkeep of these buildings. I said earlier we're very blessed by them, and we are, and they do bring in money. They're also 106 years old, and bits are falling off. So there is quite a lot that has to be done, and Karen and Martin spend a huge amount of time um, meeting men in the car park <laughs> about bits that are falling off the church. Um, but it, it is something that's very important. We've been given this building to use, to steward, um, to use for God, um, and we need to look after it, but it does take quite a lot of money. That money, though, also pays for the photocopying, it pays for the heating and lighting, the rates, the water bills, all sorts of things that we mean that we can keep the doors open every week. In terms of our worship and discipleship, it means that we can hold three services every Sunday, that we can have prayer and other meetings every day of the week. Uh, in terms of fellowship, it means that we can host activities like the Oasis Coffee Mornings and Active Seniors and the Toddler Group and the Dementia Support Group and the Photography Group. It means that children's activities and things like the uniformed organisations can happen here through the week. 
uh, and things like UT that happens on a Friday evening. And it also means we have a facility that we can provide a local venue for people to come and give blood, for people to come and vote at election time, for people to come and meet their councillor and their local police community support officer. It allows us to be there for people whenever they suddenly decide that they want or need the church because they've had a baby, because they want to get married, because somebody's died, because it's Christmas or Easter, or just because there's a crisis in their life and they suddenly need the church. So that's another big chunk. The other two really uh, significant chunks up there, obviously, are local mission, which is 15%, and using children's work, which is 11%. Local mission is something that, as a leadership, we very much felt that God has been calling us to in the last few years, doing more things, looking outwards into our community, Hence the fact that we have came up with the local outreach coordinator post. Youth and children's work is something that every time we go to the congregation and say, what do you think our priority should be? They come back and say youth and children's work. So Lol and Angus, who are currently the individuals responsible for those two things, at this point are going to appear. Um, if you went to the 9.30 service last week, you would have heard Lol and Angus interviewing each other about what they do. Um, you were lucky you got out of that because we were having an exciting service this week, but um, now is your turn to hear a little bit from Lol and Angus about what it is that they get up to. We are going to keep this brief, I think. Um, Good. This, can we put this one on because that's too tall for that one on? Is that one on? Is it on? Thanks, oh, yeah. Great. Hey. Fantastic. Um, so, as Viv explained, local outreach coordinator, that's me, youth and children's worker, that's Lol. Got three questions for each other, and we have been told to be brief, which is always very difficult. So, lol. Yeah. Sorry. What is a typical week for you? Okay, so I thought the easiest way to do this is to bring my diary, um, because I um, have bits that are in every week. So I'm going from Monday to Sunday very quickly. So on Monday, it's usually my essay day. For those who don't know, I do a master's as part of this job. The church pays for just under half of that. It's in mission, youth, and children. So Monday, I'm very lucky in that I have an essay day in that I spend the day reading. Um, this Monday, I had a meeting as well at 6.30 with a ch to plan church parade service. Tuesday, I think of as cake club day um, because that is the centre of my day when I go into a local high school and it's like a drop-in for all the teenagers, and we also have cake. Around that, I do planning in the morning, and what else have I got down here? Oh yeah, plan for an assembly. So Wednesday this week, I had an assembly with Wycliffe, and then I did some planning for Sunday. I'm actually meant to be through there, so I'm on a bit of a tight schedule. Um, and then I, what else did I do? Oh, I met someone for coffee. Thursday's technically my day off. Day off, so a little bit um, squidgy in this job. Um, I started my day off with doing an assembly in the Saltair Primary School, um, which was a lot of fun, and then I did some more essay. Friday, um, it is Youthy Day, so in the morning I had a meeting with someone about something totally unrelated to Youthy, but in the afternoon it's the day I do all my accounts and last minute prep for Youthy. This week that included going and sourcing basketballs and a basketball pump. And then Friday evening we did Youthy, where we had 21 teenage boys come and just be... Um, in the building for a bit. What about you? What is your typical week? Well, it's, it's quite difficult to describe a typical week. I have certain things like LOL that I do on a regular basis. So on a Monday afternoon, early evening, help to run the food bank at Shipley Baptist Church. And Thursday, the same, uh, early afternoon and, and evening. This week, I'm going to pray with the people who are going to run the Shipley Market Bible Stall tomorrow morning. Tuesday, uh, going to Manchester in the morning to uh, take part in a what's called a new parish conversation, talking about the things that are going on around the, the, the country, really exciting things where God is moving, calling people to, to express church and, and express the kingdom, the nature of the kingdom in a, in a different way. So that's exciting. And then in the evening, we've got staff meeting and uh, the prayer meeting as well. Tuesday's meant to be my day off. Not, not, not so good a day off this week. Um, Wednesday, I'm meeting with Maureen uh, Poynton, who is the coordinator for the early intervention program that we're involved with. Uh, Thursday, I say the, the food bank. And this week, I'm preparing... Uh, oh, on Thursday morning, I'm 
taking the assembly at Saltair Primary School and also this week preparing for the Hope on the Edge vigil which is mentioned in our new sheets. Uh, so I'm, I'm, th there's a stand to do with food poverty there that I'm involved with setting up and also I'm going to interview a volunteer at the food bank who actually started off as a client at the food bank and is now working as, as one of the chefs there. So lol, fairly busy week. Um, what is the thing or some things that you really enjoy about your job? Um, well, one of the things I forgot to mention each week I go in on a Wednesday to do one-to-one -one work under the early intervention programme that Angus and Maureen run. And I get to spend an hour with a year six pupil who is um, on the edge of exclusion from primary school, but is someone that they're concerned when they go to secondary school will immediately go in, be that labelled that, that naughty kid. So I get to spend an hour each week with him or with her um, talking through um, anything, life. Uh, we, talk, we talk a lot about self-management and anger issues, um, giving them tools and techniques. But we're also mainly there so they have someone who's there to see how they are actually doing. A lot of teachers would love to do what I do. I get to actually just be and listen to them and also praise them. A lot of these kids don't have praise because they're being too busy told what they're doing wrong. Um, other bits that I really enjoy in my job, I love working with teenagers. I'm really conscious team members of Risen are over there, so I can't say too much. Um, but I love teenagers, particularly Risen and Youthy. Um, it's a great age, it's a really difficult age. I think teenagers are very brave. Um, they have a lot going on in their life. Their bodies are going against them. They're trying to do a lot of conforming, but also not conforming. Um, and they're very wise. They have the wisdom to know, um, to ask awkward questions. They have the wisdom to know when to ask for help, something a lot of adults lose. Um, and they're really challenging in many different ways. So I, a highlight of my week is always risen and youthy on a Friday evening. How about you? What are your favourite points of your job, your highlights? Two things, really. One is encouraging people to, to pray, and to pray in a, a focused way, particularly for Shipley and for, for Bradford. So I'm involved in various things. I forgot to mention, on a Wednesday morning, I host the minister's prayer breakfast at the Saltair Canteen, where we're praying specifically for Shipley and the Believe in Shipley mission next year. And the other thing which I do a lot of, really, is, is putting people in touch with other people. So a lot of the, the ways that I've helped things to, to happen within the parish and within Shipley is simply by connecting people together. Sometimes that's by organising a meeting. So, for example, this evening there's a meeting at, live at Costa to talk about a community Christmas Day lunch that we're, we're planning um, which you're welcome to come along to if you're interested in being involved with that. Um, and it's simply a chance for people to come together as to plan and then take things forward. And quite often as part of my job, I, I have the chance to find out what other people do and think, oh, yeah, well, they could work well together. And that in itself can often help to make things happen. So, Law, finally, why do you think it's important that you are or a, a children's and youth worker is employed by the church? That's a big question. Um, well, I think it's important because um, every person deserves to be listened or heard. Um, and I think in our society, we are not always good at doing that. Um, and youth and children are one of the groups that often gets missed out. Their voices are not heard or they're disregarded you know, as not knowing or not being wise enough. And I think as a church, we have to be the exception. We have to show that that's not true. We have to show through our actions that God listens to youth and children as much as adults, that what they, what they say is of God too. Um, by employing someone me, like me, that's just one way of showing that you care and that they are valued. So I think that, that's probably a good reason to employ someone like me. How about you? I think that there's two reasons. One is that actually I've found by saying that I'm employed by the church rather than volunteering for the church, it opens doors for me. So it makes it much easier for me to go 
sometimes knocking on the door and into an organisation which I wouldn't have been able to go if I'd said, well, I'm, I'm working as a volunteer doing such and such and say I'm employed by St Peter's Church and that validates my role in a large way and say just opens doors in, in many different contexts. And, and the other thing is that really a lot of what I'm employed for is my time, the, the ability to, to spend time with people, to reflect as well. And I think this is one of the things that a lot of church leaders, particularly these days, find it really difficult to do in the midst of really busy schedules, conflicting, competing demands on their time. I'm doing some of the things that a lot of church leaders would love to do if they had the time and energy to do it. So I think it's, it's that, that sort of resource, if you like, that um, is, I find, really helpful. Right. Thank you. Thank you. So, Danny, can you shove the next slide up? We're going to move through the next few fairly quickly. So, uh, you know what Angus looks like because you've just seen him. But some of the work that Angus is involved in, if you pop up the next slide, I'm not going to go through all of these individually, but that's some of the stuff that Angus has talked about. Um, the thing I would say to you about that is that two years ago, none of that was happening. And a year ago, probably a lot of it wasn't happening. And Angus would be the last person to take the credit for it, also that it's all about him, but it has happened, a lot of it, because we've got somebody now who is able to be that catalyst that he was just talking about. And although a lot of it is delivered by other people and with other people, the difference it makes having somebody who can just kick it off and support people in delivering it is huge. Similarly with Lowell, um, you might think that that's her on the left-hand side of the left picture. It's not. For those of you who don't know, because I've been caught out before on this one, she has an identical twin sister, and that's actually Claire, not Lol. Um, but it kind of gives you the idea. They're both very good with small children. And, and there we go. And again, a list of some of the things that Lol has talked about. Work that simply we couldn't resource. It probably wouldn't be happening if we didn't have somebody whose job it was to make it happen. Hugely important thing. So the final chunk of the circle that was up there before... Next slide, thank you. The 6%, um, that's money that goes to support people who are working abroad, um, people with whom we have particular mission links who are doing incredible work um, in countries overseas. Those are the list of the main um, individuals and organisations that we support. As a church, some years ago, um, the, the leadership here made the decision that if we were going to be a church that supported tithing and wanted people to tithe their money, we should be prepared to do that ourselves as a church. So we take a chunk of the money which is given to us every year and we give it away to these people who are working um, abroad and in foreign countries. Hugely important, the work that Anne and Eric Parker do. If you don't know them, come to the 9.30 sometime and meet them, they're fab. And they run the Mission Support Group, which is an incredible faithful group of people who meet regularly, who pray for these guys. They sort out the money that we as a church give them and work out how it should be fairly divided between all our links. And most importantly... These people would say if they were here, they pray for them and they email them and keep in touch with them and let them know that we're interested in them and that we're bothered about them. Um, so again, a hugely important big chunk of what we do. So I said earlier that you might have noticed that there was something to spot between the two slides at the beginning, the one that said how much income we expected and the one that said how much we thought we were going to spend. The spending was 278,000, the income was 248,000. Even my maths can work out that's a 30,000 pound hole. So we knew from the beginning of the year that as far as the budget was concerned, we needed to spend more than we were likely to get. Looking at the finance so far this year, we're three quarters of the way through the year. That blue bar that was on the first slide that you saw, which is the money that's given by the congregation, has gone down. So we haven't got as much in as we expected. People have to review their giving. People's circumstances change. Um, there are all sorts of very good reasons why that happens. But the ultimate outcome for us is that, at the moment, that £30,000 gap at the end of the year is likely to be bigger. Um, and consequently, probably the chunk of the parish share that we'll be able to pay um, won't be as much as we'd hoped it might be. It is a scary thing for the parochial church council and the staff team when you look at that and you think, eek, that's quite a lot of money, really. I wouldn't like to have a hole like that in my personal finances. But we do have an incredible God, and a God that we know can provide, and will provide, and has provided over and over and over again. And so that's why we're coming to Harvest Gift Day next week, with a challenge, really, for the rest of this week. We've told you about how we use the resources that we've got as a church, and I guess what we're challenging you to do this week is to think about what God wants you to do 
with the resource that you've got. We've thought about the kind of God that we have over the last few weeks, an incredible, visionary, generous God, and we've thought about what that means for us in responding to that. And so there are three things that we'd especially like to challenge you to think about this week. The first is time. How do we use our time? You might have listened to Debbie talking about the big picnic this morning and thought, that's great, wonderful idea, can't possibly do it, too busy. It's interesting how if you come to God and say, do you want me to do that? Either he goes, nah, it's all right, you're a bit busy, jog on. Or he goes, yeah. And if he goes, yeah, it's amazing how the time just appears. Believe me, I wrote the book on it. There is way more than 24 hours in a day because I couldn't fit in what I do if there were only 24 hours in a day. But God makes there be as much time as you need if you're doing what he wants you to do. So we'd like to challenge you to think about small steps, little changes. Is there anything very small that you could be doing? Second challenge that we've got is about prayer. Martin, who's falling asleep on the desk at the back of the church at the moment. I know you've heard all this at 9.30. Can you skip round with your flyers again? Thank you, love. So... We'd like to challenge you to think about prayer. As a church, as I said earlier, we think that we could be doing more corporate prayer. If you want to read more about that, there's an article, unfortunately, by me, I'm afraid, but there is an article in St. Peter's News for October which goes a little bit more into why we've been thinking this and why we think that prayer for us as a church is so important. But we know that all our lives are different and there are different times when we can squeeze in a bit more prayer. And so what we want to do as a church is to set up a few more opportunities to come together and pray. So if you're an early morning person, we're going to have a session on a Thursday. I keep getting them the wrong way around. A session on a Thursday morning, 7 till 7.30. If you wake up early and you've got nothing to do, come and pray. If you're on your way to work, drop in for half an hour on the way and pray. Similarly, we're going to have a session Tuesday evening, 6 till 6.30, commuter time. If you're on your way home, spare us half an hour, stop off and pray. We want to have some time of corporate prayer here every single day of the week, which is why Martin is now giving you a little piece of paper which you can take home and stick to your fridge or wherever you put your important little pieces of paper, um, which tells you every day of the week what's going on here. Okay? Tuesday this week is the first Tuesday in the month. That means at 7.30 in here or in there on Tuesday evening will be our monthly time to come together and pray. We've put in some new sessions. We're bringing back Saturday morning bacon butty prayers. You don't get a bacon butty, but you come and pray, and then you've got time to go home and make your own bacon butty. (laughs) We want to challenge you to think about how much prayer you're doing and whether God is asking for more. And finally, obviously, there's our resources and our money. What we want to ask you to do this morning... Whoops, the next slide, boys. Avidly reading your prayer notice. Um, The finance subgroup of the PCC have thought about little things. Remember, the widow with her two coins. It's not how much you give, it's what's God asking for. Little tiny steps. The finance subgroup have been thinking about what it might take. It might take just another three quid a week. But if it's from enough people and if it's offered enough, it'll plug the gap. Small steps, little things that God might be calling us to do. Or it might be something big and sacrificial. Sometimes with giving it is. The important thing is that we dare to come to God and to ask the question. So the question we're leaving you with this morning and to go away and think about is the six o'clock question. The six o'clock question is something that was invented by uh, my ultimate boss. He's a guy called Alex Aitken, who is the head of the Government Communications Service. And Alex used to be the director of communications at Westminster City Council in London, which is one of the biggest councils in the country. And he was in charge of communications. We are the people who do the fluffy fur coat stuff, so we play about with press releases all day and make leaflets and do kind of pretty little things like that. And Alex used to come into the press office at 6 o'clock every single evening and pick randomly on somebody in his team, could have been the most junior press officer, and he would say to them, what have you done today to make the lives of the people of Westminster better? And they hated it. And they hated him for doing it. But it had a huge impact on their work because the one thing he would not let them forget was why they were there and what it was they were doing. And so we want to ask you this week to go away and ask yourself the six o'clock question. What is it that I am doing with the things that God has given me that are bringing in his kingdom this week? How am I using my house? Am I using my hospitality for God? Am I inviting people for coffee or a meal? How am I using my car? Am I generous? in the way that I use other people use the road, or am I aggressive? Speaking to myself there. 
am I always ready to offer people a lift or even to lend them my car? That would be a challenge, wouldn't it, if they need it to get somewhere? Am I thinking about generosity to the planet, maybe walking and not using my car at all? How am I using the money that God has given me to bring in his kingdom at the moment? Is there something he's saying to me about it? There are things that we can do. There are more efficient ways that we can give. Um, If you want to know more about that, he was going to say something, but I think we're out of time, Mark. But if you want to know more about that, just stand up and twist around. Do a little twirl. Wave to everybody. (laughs) This is the lovely Mark Davis, who many of you will know because he's often um, on the laptop over here. Uh, But Mark is also our gift aid secretary, which is a, a tough job that he's taken on fairly recently. But what that means is that £36,000 I was talking about earlier of gift aid, it's up to Mark to claim all of that back, which is a bit of a tough administrative job. But it means he understands all of that. And he understands the mechanisms that we have for giving here, the different ways that you can do it. It might be that the same amount of money would go further. It's just that you've never thought of how it might go further. If you want to talk about that in confidence, please do approach Mark. He'll be more than happy to talk to you about it, to explain how that works. Um, and to go through it. He's here at all the services today. He's here all week. Um, But if that would help you, please do that. But this week, let's go away and think about the six o'clock question and what God might be saying to us in answer to it. We're going to have our prayers now. And um, unfortunately, when I looked at the service order, I realised that that was me as well. And I thought you'd be sick of the sound of my voice. So um, hopefully there are some prayer leaves around still, are there, Jules? Um, So, Julie's going to pass amongst you, and if you haven't got a prayer leaf, wave, and Julie or Martin will give you a leaf. But what we'd like to do is, boys, there's another slide somewhere. Sorry, I shouldn't call you boys. Danny, thank you. There we go. We're just going to play a song. Um, It's a very short song, don't worry, it doesn't go on for too long. And Martin and Julie are going to be handing around some uh, leaves. I think there are some pens, or if you can share pens amongst you, that would be helpful. What we'd like you to do is just to think about these three things and perhaps to write the prayer on your leaf. Where do you want God to be generous in his world today? Where do you want to see God being generous in this church today? And where do you want to ask God to be generous for those that you love or you know or you're concerned for today? We'd like to ask you to think about those three things and perhaps to write some of your prayers on the leaves Um, and then we'll have a plate at the back if you'd like to leave them in the plate at the end of the service. We'll put them on the trees and fill them out, make them look a little bit more spring-like before the end of the service. So let's pray together.